choosing to watch our Right Heart tutorial, featuring some of the highlights of our full Right Heart course. In this three-part series, we'll provide you with some essential teaching points that will be helpful if you work as a healthcare professional. In the first part, we'll cover important topics related to the anatomy and physiology of the right heart, and we'll also look into the role of echocardiography as well as radiology in diagnosing diseases of the right heart, especially when it comes to making the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. But where is the right heart actually located in the chest? Well, anterior. As you can see here on this model, this is the right heart. And if you look closely, you will see that much of the right heart is actually hidden behind the sternum. Let's remove the lung and take a closer look inside the chest. Now, if I open up the model, you can see that the right heart is actually located here in the midline and that much of the right heart is, as I mentioned before, hidden behind the sternum. Now, another very important point to consider is that the pulmonary artery is actually anterior to the aortic artery. This will be important, especially when we take a look on the echocardiogram, when we try to interpret the structures there. Let's take a closer look at the structures we see in a so-called body donor, a corpse. What do we see here? Well, if we open up the pericardial sac here, we'll see the right heart right in front here. Now let's move to the anatomy of the right ventricle. What is so unique about the right ventricle? Its shape. It resembles that of a bagpipe. With a portion of the right ventricle, which we call the inflow and outflow tract. This is the inflow and this is the outflow tract. What other features are important to consider? Well, of course, the wall is much thinner of the right ventricle than that of the left ventricle because the pressure in the right circulation is much less than in the left or systemic circulation. We have a lot of trapeculations in the right ventricle and we have a very prominent structure which we call the moderator band. We'll take a closer look at that structure a little bit later. So the right ventricle is said to wrap around the left ventricle. You can nicely appreciate that the wall of the right ventricle is thinner than that of the left ventricle. We have, again, the strong trabeculations here with one very strong trabeculation, usually in the distal part of the free lateral wall of the right ventricle, expanding to the septum, which is called the moderator band. And we can separate a portion that we call the inflow. That's where the blood enters into the right ventricle via the tricuspid valve. Physiologists often compare the contractile function of the right ventricle to that of a bellows. Let's hear from Elena which different components of right ventricle function we can actually describe. Actually, there are three mechanisms of RV systolic function. And first one is the longitudinal shortening of the right ventricle and the traction of tricuspid valve towards the apex. The second one is the inward movement of the RV free wall. And finally, the last one is bulging of the interventricular septum into the right ventricle during the left ventricular contraction and stretching the free wall of the right ventricle over the septum. Now, Ellen, I have a question here. When you look at the relative contribution of the longitudinal component versus the radial component of the right ventricle, how does that differ from that of the left ventricle? Well, actually, the longitudinal component of RV systolic function is the major contributor to the global systolic function of this chamber, and it's completely different in the left ventricle. Uh, however, in different patients with different pathology, the relationship between radial and longitudinal contraction may be completely different. For example, in patients after heart transplantation, we all know that longitudinal function is reduced, and that's why the radial component is very prominent. That's why it's very important to be able to assess longitudinal and radial components of RV systolic function separately in real clinical practice. What is a normal right atrial pressure? Well, it's somewhere in the range of 2 to 6 millimeters mercury. And what happens if right atrial pressure increases? Well, it translates into the IVC and into the SVC. 
Usually, at least in echocardiography, we assess more the IVC and there we can see the effects of an increase in pressure by just looking at the size of the IVC. This is an example of a massively dilated IVC. It's probably somewhere in the range of four or five centimeters even. It's one of the largest IVCs I've actually seen. And not only does the IVC expand, but it also dilates the hepatic veins. Now, a dilated IVC does not necessarily mean that the pressure is increased. We also see it if there is a volume increase in the right atrium, for example, in tricuspid regurgitation. And there are some individuals, as you will hear later, that simply have a larger IVC than others. But nevertheless, the pressure in the right atrium can actually be directly visualized by looking at the IVC. But there are more views. And these are the views I want to show you, views that are so important when it comes to assessing the right heart. First, let's talk about the so-called parasternal long axis view of the right ventricle. The parasternal long axis view through the right ventricle is such an important view. And actually, I think that it should be a part of every exam. And it's very easy to get. You start out from a parasternal long axis view, and all you need to do is tilt the transducer down. This is the motion you perform to get the long axis view. What are the anatomical structures that you can identify? This is the right ventricle. This is the right atrium. The thin structure is the coronary sinus here. And this is the IVC that you can follow relatively far distal as it enters here into the right atrium. Now, Sometimes it would make sense to move the transducer down one intercostal space and you can get an even better view of the right ventricle. Now let's move to the same view, but this time we'll take a look at it in a simulation so that you see the relationship of the anatomic structures to each other. Let's take a close look at the four chamber view and its different variations. Now, if I Tilt the transducer a little bit more caudal, you will see the coronary sinus right here. This longitudinal structure is at the base of the heart and enters the right atrium. It's the coronary sinus. Vice versa, if you tilt the transducer, you will get to the aortic valve. This is the classic five chamber view. But remember that with a little bit tilting of the transducer, you can even see the pulmonary veins. This is the right upper pulmonary vein, which is very important if you want to assess Doppler flow into the left atrium. But you can also see the left upper and sometimes also the left lower pulmonary vein, which is close to the left atrial appendage, which can be seen sometimes, especially if it's large, in some patients right here at the junction between the left ventricle and the left atrium. It's also important to note that you can get certain variations of the four chamber view if you want to focus on certain structures. For example, if I want to see the right ventricle, I would move the transducer a little bit more lateral, then I'm more perpendicular to the right ventricle wall, which can be seen very nicely here. Vice versa, if I move the transducer more to the medial, to the sternum, I will have the septum slanted in such a direction that you have a very good appreciation of the lateral wall right here. We, however, use basically diameter measurements in every patient. To do that, we perform a four-chamber view, or as you will see later, an optimized four-chamber view to measure the right ventricle from the lateral side to the septum. There are three measurements which are now basically recommended by the Guidelines Association where we are looking at the diameter at the base, at the mid of the ventricle, and also at the length of the right ventricle. Now, if we look at the base of the right ventricle, the range that we are expecting a normal patient to be is somewhere between 25 and 41 millimeters. For the mid diameter, 19 to 35. So you see the ventricle has kind of a triangular shape. It is slimmer in the mid than it is at the base. And if we look at the length of the right ventricle, the range is 59 to 83 millimeters. Now, we very rarely use the length, at least not in our lab. We do use, however, the mid-diameter very, very frequently. The 
Basal diameter is more of importance if you want to look at tricuspid regurgitation and to see how annual dilatation is. But all of these measurements are recommended. Now let's turn to another view where you can look at the size of the right ventricle, which is the right ventricle outflow tract. And here you would perform a parasternal short axis view at the base and then perform a measurement in this region. Here you have a very nice delineation between the pericardium and the free lateral wall. And this is exactly where we would measure. The normal values are in a range of one to five millimeters. And basically three is the average thickness of the free right ventricular wall. Here you can see the measurement performed right here. Let's see some examples and let me show you that sometimes it's easy to even semi-quantitively see if there is right ventricular hypertrophy. Of course you need good image quality and you have to focus exactly on the right ventricular wall so that you truly are able to assess the thickness. Here is an example of a normal patient where you see that the right ventricular wall is actually of normal size here. In contrast, this patient with massive pulmonary hypertension shows significant right ventricular hypertrophy. But you can also see this in a four-chamber view, in this case in an optimized four-chamber view. Here we have a normal wall thickness and this patient definitely has right ventricular hypertrophy. Now if you just simply compare the thickness of the free lateral wall with that of the septum, you can see that it's almost the same thickness. So this denotes right ventricular hypertrophy, and in this case, it's not even necessary to measure anymore. Now, in our reports, we would usually not put the measurement. We would just state whether or not right ventricular hypertrophy is present or not. Let's turn to the subcoastal view. Remember, this is the preferred view to look at the thickness of the right ventricle wall. And again, let us compare a normal individual with a normal right ventricular thickness and here a patient with significant right ventricle hypertrophy. Be aware though that measurements, of course, are sometimes very difficult because the right ventricle is strongly trabeculated. So don't measure into the trabecula, but really look at the compacted part of the right ventricle. Now there is, of course, different degrees of right ventricle dysfunction. And there's also an entity that I would call the dead right ventricle. This is a patient who had right ventricle myocarditis, a very rare cause. It was an immunological disease. And what happened here was that the right ventricle was even electrophysiologically completely dead. And there was practically only very little contraction left. You see that the right ventricle is not moving at all and that even the tricuspid valve is not closing, not only because there's annual dilatation, but, but because there is no pressure in the right ventricle to close the tricuspid valve. And this can also be seen here in this example where there is tricuspid regurgitation with almost no turbulent flow, simply because the pressure in the right ventricle was not high. Here again is the same patient in an earlier stage that was when he had, you know, the acute onset of this myocarditis and you see that there is no contraction here. The tricuspid valve is just moving back and forth more with relationship to respiration than really to the contraction of the right ventricle. And here you see that despite the fact that the valve is open, we don't really see any turbulent flow. The last parameter I want to show you is my favorite parameter. It's right ventricular strain. What is it? Well, basically we're using a technology which is called speckle tracking. Here we are tracking the motion of these bright little echoes that you see throughout the entire myocardium here. And with this, you're able to actually look at the percentage shortening of the myocardium, especially important is the motion of the longitudinal function, which can be assessed both for the left and for the right ventricle. Now, the left ventricle, of course, was the first ventricle that we use speckle tracking on, and there's just so much data that shows it's an early 
marker of left ventricular function, and there's just so much data on this already. But there's also an increasing amount of data on the right ventricle showing that it works quite nicely. We're, of course, defining, first of all, which parts of the right ventricle should be tracked. In this case, we're only tracking here the lateral wall. And then we perform the analysis, and the system basically gives us a percentage value of contraction, in this case, of the lateral wall. And this is a methodology which allows you to do a lot of calculations. Not only can we look at the entire myocardium, but also look at the individual segments, the base, the mid, and the apex. We have different ways of displaying these curves and, uh, and the data. But the bottom line is that we now know that there is a value that is somewhere in the range of minus 27, 28, which is normal. Now, this is a value which is higher than the global longitudinal strain that you would use for the left ventricle, simply because, as you remember, the right ventricle shows more longitudinal contraction. And there's been some discussions in the literature with different papers showing different cutoff values. Here we had some papers where the values were probably too low. But speckle tracking is now included in the guidelines as a methodology that you can use to assess right ventricle function. But how valid is actually pulmonary pressure? How good is echocardiography? And how does it really relate to the pressures that we measure with the cath? There are some discrepancies um, between right of cath and echo based on the echo window you use to assess the systolic pulmonary artery pressure by assessing the tricuspid uh, regurgitation jet velocity. And also the pressures in, in the pulmonary circulation are dependent on the time of the day. For example, if you measure the pressure in the morning, it's different from in the evening. And if you perform the right cath at a different time, uh, time point in the day, you get discrepancies from, um, compared to echo. But also there are some limitations of echo. Sometimes the, the pressures as assessed at echo are, um, are higher than, than those in the right cath. Yes, this is certainly something to consider. We have two different methodologies, which both have advantages and disadvantages. And basically, echocardiography is more a screening technique. If you really want to make the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, you will need a right heart catheter. But there is an important other parameter that you can use that will help you, especially in situations where you cannot get a TR signal, and that is the pulmonary acceleration time. Let me show in the following demonstration how we actually acquire such a signal and how we measure the pulmonary acceleration time. The first thing that you need to do is display the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary artery. And we do this with a parasternal short axis view at the base. And then we have the pulmonary artery right here with the pulmonary valve. And then what we do is we place the pulse wave Doppler spectrum right underneath the valve, and we obtain a signal which looks like this here. Okay, so we'll freeze the image and pick the beat that we want to measure, and then we simply measure from the beginning of the spectrum, which is right here, all the way to the peak here. And then we get a pulmonary valve acceleration time of 139 milliseconds. So this is a normal pulmonary valve acceleration time, as you will see later. So this patient has a fairly low likelihood of having pulmonary hypertension. There's always been some discussions where you should actually place the post wave Doppler spectrum, because a lot of people say it should be placed in the RVOT. But I do not agree, because if you place it in the RVOT, we have an angle, because the orientation of the RVOT is not parallel to the ultrasound beam. So I would prefer to actually place the sample volume a little bit underneath the valve. And if you kind of almost have a little bit of the valve inside your sample volume, you get a very sharp beginning, which is good to have because then you know exactly from where you should start to measure. For the right heart, um, the basic imaging we use is still the conventional radiology imaging, the conventional X-ray, this is still the basis for everything. Um, the next step will be CT imaging, to image the right heart with a CT. 
This can be a conventional thoracic CT with contrast media or this also can be a dedicated cardiac CT to image the right heart and also the left heart. The third step, the more specialist step, is imaging with MR. This needs a little bit more time, a little bit more experience, but you also can um, image the right heart very, very nicely um, with MRI. You have to think about when you do a, a CT scan of every part of the body with a dedicated high-end CT machine, a new generation CT machine, you produce a volume data set of the region of interest, of the head, of the thorax, of the abdomen, of the foot, whatever, every region. So you have a volume data set. These are very, very thin slices, starting with 0.4 millimeters. And with this data set, you can do everything. You can do all kind of reconstruction. You can look on the images in the Excel view. You just go through the body like in the older CT times, but you also can do a reconstruction, every other projection you can think about, sagittal, corner, or even in every other direction. Um, regarding the volume rendering techniques or these highly fancy um, 3D techniques, you also you can just use your mouse, use this data set on a workstation, you just move the mouse around and you get for example only the bones or you get the skin or you get the face of the patient and, and every other um, part of the patient. Um, so with a modern CT machine you do a scan and after the scan you can do with this data set all you want. Regarding the usefulness of these very nice images and also love them, in many cases it's just for reporting, just for presentation. For example, when you talk to surgeons about cardiac imaging and also about pulmonary arteries, they love these images because it looks the same as if they look in the patient. And when I sometimes go to the operation theater and I look in the thorax, I see the heart there and I feel the heart in my hand there and it's really the same like in the CT imaging and I really loved it. For example, I also sometimes use this 3D imaging when I do a some kind of intervention, for example, an embolization of an aneurysm of the splenic artery. In this case, I also want to have a 3D impression of this um, aneurysm or even of a tumor or of an organ in order that I can put this information in my head and when I'm in the angel, I have a 2D image, an angel, a conventional angiography is a 2D image, but I have in my brain a 3D image so I can imagine how to get there, how to go in the right vessel to come to the aneurysm and so on. Regarding the contrast media and CT, you might have two problems. The first problem is if there is an allergy to iodine contrast media in patients. There you have a history of the patient. You know there was a problem one year or whatever ago. And you have to treat these patients before. Um, there is the so-called LASA scheme. So you give them um, cortisone before and you give them on the table a uh, antihistaminicum and then this might be no problem. Nevertheless, from time to time you have patients they had never a contrast media before and so you might run in problems during um, the application of contrast media. On the other hand you might run into trouble with the kidneys so when you have an impaired kidney function um, you're not allowed to give contrast media and this you definitely should not do. For example when you have a creatinine of 1.5 or 2 or whatever and you give contrast media this patient really might run into troubles with his kidneys. I do hope you enjoyed the first part of our tutorial and that it was helpful for your clinical practice. This video is now yours and you can always come back to it again. That's the joy of online learning. And be sure to watch part 2 where we will dig deeper into the topic of pulmonary hypertension. This video will also be available to you shortly. Thank you.